Hi, Hi. How are you? Good. Wow, what a nice scene you have behind you. What is oh, yes. It's um, my uh, in-laws, oh, back in the 80s, gave us this, uh, this uh, uh, oriental screen when they were uh, visited Hong Kong. And we've treasured it ever since, especially since now they're both gone. It's a nice memory. Oh, that's wonderful. Great. So uh, are you in um, New Orleans now? Yes, in yeah. New Orleans. And <clears throat> things are, uh, have really stabilized here. And uh, we're in uh, phase one of reopening. And um, so uh, even salons and barbers and retail shops can see people uh, as long as uh, social distancing is maintained and people wear masks. So we're all trying to do our part so that phase one goes well so we can go into phase two. Great. Um, I just see that our friends from Evelis joined in. Uh... Uh, Kendall uh, Klinger and Marshall Durham. So, Hi, Dana. Uh, aesthetics Intervention. Mary, you've got a big following. Achromatic. Um, so, so what is phase, what is phase, uh, difference between phase two and phase one? Phase two will be larger venues and um, probably uh, things like um, sm uh, uh, bars. You know, bars are still not open unless the bar happens to serve food. Mm -hmm. And there's a few more restrictions in New Orleans than there is across the state because the um, mayor is more restrictive than our governor. Um, I really have to compliment, I think John Bell Edwards has done a great job um, of balancing the, uh, the medical and the he uh, public health issue and doing his best to um, not hurt the economy any more than is necessary. And you're in Texas, and you know also that we're suffering because oil prices are so bad. So Louisiana is taking a big hit. And I think I really like the fact that he's not politicizing this problem. The, the, the politicizing of this pandemic has really caused me a lot of repulsion uh, with how people have been handling it. And if, if anything is needed to have people come together, I think it's when the health of people is involved. Right, right. So um, I had a little bit of inside, um, not inside information, but insights into uh, New Orleans. <clears throat> you know, Fred Golly, who's on our board, his brother's uh, chancellor, <clears throat> one of the big universities there. And uh, he's an otolaryngologist, so he was in the trenches, and we were seeing how sick everyone was. And I think the government really paid attention to the doctors there. Um, well, we've had a lot of positive cases, and we've had a lot of people who've never had to go to the hospital. Yeah. And we have people that um, had very mild disease. We've, we've had the spectrum. And, you know, I think we talked, the last time we talked about a month ago, you know, we discussed the fact that what's so mysterious about this is the variation of the immune response mm -hmm. in some people and how uh, disturbing that is. And of course, in New Orleans, we have a lot of comorbidity. We have a very high rate of obesity and diabetes and hypertension and hypertension and diabetes causing secondary comprom compromised renal function. So you know, being a, a very experienced cardiologist, that when you get system failure um, and you get a lot of organs involved, it, it, it is a very, very touch and go situation. Right, right. I mean, the odds of getting really sick or low, but you don't want this, I mean, under <laughs> any, any circumstances. I think there are two factors that um, people forget to really think about when you're talking to somebody on the other end uh, or in front of you or your colleagues. Um, I divide it in two ways. One, um, you know, how are they doing emotionally? How strong are they? Are they really fearful? Do they have the ability to bring, the, bring out the best in other people? You know, if you get sick, if you can be sort of positive and let people rally around you and help you and get the good care that you can, I think that will be helpful. But that's, you know, it's a hard mindset. Um, yeah, some, and over 40% of our fatalities were nursing home related. Um, yeah. And we had a lot of people 
curiously that were in nursing homes that uh, passed away in the past couple of months and not from COVID, but they had memory issues and their separation from their family members really hit them hard and they deteriorated very rapidly right. because of the loss of normalcy to their routine. Right. And so we do have to protect our elderly and make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect them uh, by being responsible with how we, you know, what I tell people, I said, we need to proceed with caution, but we need to proceed. We can't stay at home forever. And there've been lots of cases in New York mysteriously that have been homebound people that have gotten this. So there's no guarantee of anything in life. And, you know, you get in an automobile and you drive to a destination and you could be taken out by an 18 wheeler. So what do you do? You drive safely, you drive defensively, you wear your seatbelt, you do things to skew your, your, the chances of your not being involved in an accident. And if you aren't involved in an accident, surviving. So, so what? we need to proceed with that and have people wear masks and do what they can to wash their hands. I'm a big believer that I think gloves are a bad idea. I agree completely. Well, gloves gloves are terrible right idea. Yeah. Wash your hands. And we talk, you know, I've already talked several spoken several times and done posts about, you know, your product and CLN and what a big believer I am in its usefulness uh, for a lot of medical conditions, but also in situations like this. You know, I think a lot of people maybe don't know how you came upon this, uh, this invention of yours, this product. And I think being a doctor and being then a patient. Yeah. Why don't you share that perspective? And then I'll talk about how, even though I'm primarily a, a aesthetic physician and do injections, how I became uh, so enamored with the product and how we became connected. Sure. But tell people about what happened, what you went through. Sure. Um, about 10 to, well, actually 12 years ago now, I had a, a serious skin infection on my shin. It was related to staph, methicillin resistant staph called cellulitis and it grew really pretty quickly uh, I saw you know our friend here uh, Dr. Clay Cockrell who's my dermatologist gave me antibiotics topically orally then he gave me chlorhexidine I think so I was I didn't really tolerate that soap well so he recommended bleach baths so there I was uh, you know making a bleach bath which is a bottle of you know a quarter cup of Clorox half a tub of water so you dilute that a thousand fold and then you sit in it for 10 minutes, three times a week. Then you shower afterwards. So it's a really cumbersome process. Um, and I went back to him and then when really studying the area, I found a couple things that hypochlorous, which is made in white cells and hypochloride, which is in bleach are wonderful products. They've been around for a lot, a lot of years. Um, and sodium hypochlorite or bleach or Dakin solution has been around since World War I. It actually improves wound healing in low concentrations. So I'm not talking about Clorox bottle, which is six and a half or eight percent. I'm talking a very, very diluted uh, bleach. So we then took that and uh, in, instead of using it as a bathtub, we created a, um, you know, a gel, a gel cleanser uh, out of that essentially uh, making the uh, it's just a it's a gel clear gel um, you can you know rub it on uh, it's designed to be a wash but you can uh, mm -hmm. at least right. you, you can leave it on it's so yeah. so you know we've known about bleach baths in dermatology for a long time uh, both because you know um, uh, not just for M MRSA, but also for people with atopic dermatitis. Right. As people with atopic dermatitis have um, uh, excessive flora on their skin. And in fact, probably a lot of atopic dermatitis is actually caused by the body's immune response to the, um, to the bacteria on the skin. So having a balanced biome uh, and good bacteria uh, as opposed to bad bacteria and our body's immune response to it. It's very reminiscent of some of the things we're talking about with COVID and the immune response to this, to an organism. So with CLN, uh, like with bleach baths, you're getting a decrease in the bacteria, but there's also a little bit of an anti-inflammatory benefit. 
And I, I think that that's wise. Now, initially in my practice, because I do see if I, maybe five to 10% of my patients are longstanding. I've been in practice for over 35 years and I have medical patients. And so initially I was using it for folliculitis, um, for folliculitis in the scalp, folliculitis on the body, people with atopic eczema, the occasional child that I would see with atopic eczema, uh, adults with um, staph problems and, and things like that. And then I had this sort of light bulb go off and decided that I would start using it for all of my filler patients pre, um, pre-injection. And the reason I did that was because I, I use a lot of the biostimulatory fillers. I'm a big fan of Sculpture and Radius. And you do not want to get any um, microbiome, um, bacterial contamination of those fillers while you're implanting them into the skin. And being in South Louisiana, we have atypical mycobacterium in our tap water uh -huh. So I never like to use uh, water to as a last step with a cleanser before I would clean them. So I started actually using the CLN as a wipe and then would just wipe off the excess uh, before I would inject and not have water be on the skin at all. And it, it's been very noticeable to me because there's a lot of discussion about inflammatory nodules with filler and knock on wood, even though I do a lot, you know, I don't get that. And, you know, I have no way of knowing for sure how much your product has contributed to the lack of that adverse event in my practice, if you will. But, you know, I'm, I, I've, I've used it now for a long time, probably what, about three years I told you I started using it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you turned to, uh, you, you educated us uh, on that. And there's there's a little bit of that evidence on bleach baths. St study out of Stanford showed that there's uh, less inflammation with bleach baths um, in in the mice in the rat model. Uh, reduced aging and it's also antimicrobial. So they showed that there are uh, you know cellular activity that's improved uh, by this. And then there's another set of products uh, that are out of hypochlorous, which is the spray and the gel uh, made by another company that a lot of aesthetics is, uh, use as well. So this combination of products is actually, I think, really quite useful. Um, right. And, and it started with you putting it on the face, and then later on, uh, several of you, you are using it as a leave-on. And the eczema mm -hmm. patients, which were all driven by staff in our studies, we saw that the... Uh, use of steroids went down, actually itching went down almost 40%. You know, eczema is a, you know, you know, very much an itch disease. So, um, and then anecdotally, people use it on bee stings and other things. So it has some anti-inflammatory properties, which we can't really quantify, and you've, you're seeing that clinically probably. So, so it makes sense. Um, well, you know, you said something very, very interesting, and, you know, it might be an interesting sort of, academic theoretical discussion. And that is, you mentioned, you kind of threw in anti-aging there. And, you know, really aging is a type of uh, uh, degenerative, but I think that there's an inflammatory component to aging. So we know that there are many uh, sort of issues, you know, the telomere theory and free radical theory and but free free radical sort of feeds into inflammatory mediators and things like that. And it's very intriguing because a lot of times I really like to educate my patients about medical and dermatological problems. And for years, I pretty much told patients when they go, well, what caused this? Let's say they asked me about psoriasis. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, I just th I think just about every disease that human beings get can be broken down into one of three categories. It can be caused primarily by a an organism and be infectious. It can be neoplastic, and that neoplasia can be benign overgrowth or it can be malignant overgrowth. But the third and definitely the most vast category, I think, of disease in human is the inflammatory category. And this includes, in my opinion, heart disease. 
This includes all of the rheumatoid arthritis, the psoriasis, um, the atopy, you know, all of these inflammatory conditions. I think, you know, you could probably classify multiple sclerosis maybe as some sort of low-grade virus that simulates an immune response. And we can get into all of these really, really interesting categories. But, you know, we've made a lot of progress in the past, you know, century with infectious diseases. We've made a lot of progress with neoplasia, with cancer, and with cancer research. And, and we are making a lot of progress with inflammatory conditions, with the IL uh, inhibitors and, and, and all of the, the, the injectables and the biologics that we have available to us. So I think it's a very, very exciting time to be in medicine. But there's no question that, you know, when it comes to aging, aging ha is, a, is a multifactorial, I call it a chronic relapsing skin disease. <laughs> That's what I call aging. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, for sure, the ultraviolet light is an issue, but that's because the ultraviolet light caused a degeneration and a deterioration of the dermal structures, the collagen, the elastin, the dermal ground substances, the chondroitin, the hyaluronic acid. And it's a very complex symphony of problems. And I think there's variability in how people age because it's a, there's a variability in how their immune system responds to these degraded proteins. And as the collagen and the elastin is deteriorated and degenerated by ultraviolet light and pollutants, some people's immune system come in and cause this excessive inflammatory response and they lose tremendous elasticity in their skin. Whereas other people, it's not so bad. Yeah. So there's a lot of variability that I think is genetically and uh, it could be epigenetics as well as true genetic triggers. Um, but it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and, and we could talk about that forever because if no one can prove us wrong with what, what our theory is. Well, I'm going to send you the paper out of Stanford by uh, Dr. Leong. And it shows that the aging protein is called P16 actually goes down with, with bleach baths. And it'll be interesting for you to take a look. It also reduces radiation damage. Um, and, you know, model of aging that I've seen in medical derm is the eczema group that we've done a lot of work with. And I mean, they get a lot of scarring, uh, lichenification, et cetera. It's probably a very similar reaction to the ablative procedures uh, that you all do if, it, if it's not done well or there's not enough <clears throat> precautions uh, in the right skin typing. So, Well, you know, one interesting phenomenon I've seen is that people who have uh, chronic and severe medical dermatological diseases do have more accelerated aging of their skin. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is people who had severe acne in their 20s and had scarring, when they get into their 40s, their wrinkling is so much more severe than another 40-year-old who didn't have the acne scarring. And I think it has something to do with that abnormal scar tissue in the dermis and some sort of accelerated immune response to those, um, those damaged dermal protein. So, so what do you tell, uh, expand on that. So um, a young person, 20 year old with acne, what can they do now to help themselves down the road? Great question. Um, so, you know, it's very, very important to see a board certified dermatologist because we know all of the little tricks and we have the appropriate prescriptions and you know we are very much leaning toward the treatment of acne with no antibiotics or as little as possible because of the systemic effects of antibiotics i think it is it, it is far safer long term for a patient to be on four months of accutane than to be on two years of doxycycline okay. now of course when you talk about Accutane, you need to make sure that this is a person who is not going to get pregnant. But all of the side effects that people hear and fear about Accutane really have been proven to be excessively overblown, uh, with the exception of birth defects being a very real uh, potential complication. But you know, if you get an elevation of liver enzymes, 
you lower the dose, those liver enzymes come down, or it means you're drinking too much while you're on the Accutane. Right. If you have elevations of triglycerides, it's almost always an unmasking of a familial hyperlipidemia that okay. in a young person was previously unrecognized, and it's a strong family history. But even so, those kids can, you know, watch, you know, there's nothing that elevates triglycerides more than alcohol, but Accutane, Accutane can do it also. So we need to be very cautious. We need to monitor the triglycerides and, and the liver enzymes. But Accutane is such an amazing drug. And being a retinoid, remember retinoid have, retinoids have anti-inflammatory actions as well. And decreasing the inflammation, people on who've had Accutane often have less aging of their skin than people who've never taken Accutane because of that retinoid benefit, much the, much the same way as long-term use of, of a tretinoin or a tazeratine on the face is associated with uh, decreased skin aging as we get older. But regarding the young people, obviously good care is important, but the single worst thing that they can do is manipulate uh, an acne lesion. And what I mean by that is squeeze it or poke it because what you inevitably do is you disrupt that pilosebaceous unit or pore at the dermal level. And when you fractionate- Pilosebaceous, explain that in uh, layman's terms. Okay, so pilosebaceous is your pore, but it's not your sweat pore, which is the eccrine. It's a sebaceous uh, pore where, um, so a, an eccrine duct goes from the dermis straight to the surface of the skin. A pilosebaceous is, a, is, like a, is like an elevator track with a side piece that has a, a sebaceous gland or an oil gland attached to it. And what happens with acne is somewhere here, there's a plug and a, a physical plug is sometimes, and sometimes it's just a plug of inflammatory mediators constricting the pore. The oil can't get out. Well, when the oil backs up, there are organisms in our skin that convert the triglycerides of sebaceous oil and break it down into free fatty acids. Well, free fatty acids are highly inflammatory to the skin. And that's what causes a lot of the damage to the dermis. So you want to do things that unclog the pore. And the, probably the best thing we have are the retinoids. And, you know, what you don't want to do is you don't want to do a physical scrub. Uh, it, it, it really, cl the cleansing, the physical cleansing and the exfoliating just on the surface, it's like I tell people, if you've got a clogged drain, you don't pull out the comet and scrub the sink surface. You get Drano and you put the Drano down the hole. And the retinoids help normalize the cellular turnover of the cells lining that pilosebaceous unit and allow for a better flow, plus retinoids are anti-inflammatory. So, you know, the retinoids are the number one drug that should be tried on acne before antibiotics. And that would include tretinoin, it would include tazeratine. Um, there's a new one um, by Galderma, the trade name of it is a cleef. There's a great new one coming out, great from Ortho, called Araslo, which is a very, very advanced delivery system for tazeratine. Tazeratine is so good because it not only helps the active acne, but it is preventative for the acne of the future, your acne lesion you would have gotten a month from now, and it improves post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation better than any of the other retinoids in my experience. And I take that experience because practicing in New Orleans, I have a very large skin type, um, Fitzpatrick skin types four, five, and six, African-American, darkly pigmented patients that get horrific problems with what's called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which means after an inflammatory injury to the skin, you produce more pigment. And the problem is, is that pigment is not in the epidermis. It's in the dermis. And bleaching agents don't do anything for it. 
you've got to use a retinoid for post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Wow, that was awesome. Uh, that was great. Uh, and it's going to be uh, posted so people can review this. I think you're going to help a lot of people with acne. So once they're scarring, what do you do with devices? You're, you're uh, the device... Uh, so... So my number one go-to for acne scars is, is Fraxel. And the reason, and I use the, I have the dual, which is two wavelength, but the wavelength that is superior for acne scars is the 1550 nanometer. And um, it can be safely used in all skin types. So I have to have a device that's reliable and safe for the spectrum of diversity of patients that I have. And what I do uh, with acne scars and darker skin is I tend to uh, use moderate densities. With white patients, I'll use very high, not densities, excuse me, I'll use very high fluence, very high energies, 55 millijoules, 70 millijoules with the 1550 for skin types, say one, two, and three. With my darker skin types, I've got to lower it but I'm a bit more aggressive than the most doctors because I'm so comfortable with darker skin. Yeah. Can, can and I'll I stop usually- you there? Can I, yeah, let me stop. Can you start over again be, uh, on, on the energy levels in the Fitzpatrick? Just go through that one sure. more time. I think it was a little quick. So if I'm gonna use my 1550 for acne scars on a skin type, say definitely one or two, I'm usually which is starting- light skin, light skin. Which right? is one and two with Fitzpatrick refers to the skin's ability to respond to ultraviolet light. Okay. So a skin type one would be someone who has, you know, red hair, very light blonde hair, light eyes, and they are physiologically incapable of tanning. All they do is burn. Okay. Skin type two is much more common. Skin type two is the typical, uh, say, um, northern and uh, Western European who are fair uh, and will easily burn, but if they get ultraviolet light slowly, they can gradually tan. So I, with my German, French, and Italian heritage, I am a classic skin type two. I'm fair, but I can tan. I don't do it because I don't want the damage. I'm too vain, but I could tan if I wanted to. Okay. Skin type three would be more someone who's predominantly Mediterranean, Southern European, like uh, Italian, Spanish. And when I say Spanish, I mean Spanish. I don't mean Hispanic. Hispanic is a mixture of uh, Spanish and Native American from the, uh, from the uh, colonial times when the Spanish invaded North America and plundered the Native American populace. And, and, and so Hispanic refers to a combination of Native American and Spanish. And I have to be very mindful because Cajuns, uh, which I have a large population in Southern uh, Louisiana that come and see me, most Cajuns, true Cajuns, are a combination of French and Native Americans. Because in the 1740s and 50s and 60s, when the human rights atrocity of the British kicking the French Canadians out of Acadia, and they came to South Louisiana, they were embraced by the Native Americans here. And there was a lot of intermarrying and intermingling of, of, of DNA and bloodlines. And so a lot of people come in with their cute Cajun accents. They got a lot of Native American in them, my friend. Yes, share. Yeah, they got it. So. I can't treat them like I would a normal uh, French heritage person. Um, I, so I specifically did my DNA because I wanted to know being from South Louisiana and being from New Orleans, you know, did I have any African American or a any Native American? And I didn't think I would have any Native American because I didn't have any Canadian French background. All my French background came directly from France in the early 1800s. I didn't have people come here for me in my bloodline in the 1700s via Canada. So I didn't have either of those. So I'm really safe to be aggressive. So on me, I could easily take 55 millijoules, 70 millijoules. 
But if you're, say, uh, Italian and you're skin type three, which means <clears throat> you're not fair, um, but you're not cafe au lait colored, you're sort of olive, co co olive complected, those patients tan more easily than I do. So for a patient like that, I'll probably start at maybe 40 millijoules, not the 55 millijoules. And then what I do with the skin types four, five, and six, which just mean they're darker in skin tone, and uh, each subsequent number of four tans um, more easily than three, five more easily than four, and six, it's very, very difficult to have a skin type six patient sunburn. Uh, their skin will feel hot, but it's very difficult to appreciate any clinical sunburn visually. Um, but so, so for those patients, I'll typically do like 30 millijoules. But what I do, that's the fluence. What I do to, um, to make it more safe um, and yet get the efficacy is to have the Fraxel drill the holes as deeply as I feel I safely can, but I decrease the density. And by decreasing the density, you have greater skip areas of normal skin with unaffected pigment cells to maintain a normal pigment color. And I've had patients with darker skin tone where I've done this and I've had great luck. And what we, the reason I like Fraxel is the heat goes into the dermal layer where you have the damaged collagen tissue or scars from the acne and you have a controlled wound that when you get new collagen production, the old damaged collagen, uh, damaged scar tissue goes deeper in the skin and you get a layer of healthier um, collagen and elastic tissue in the upper levels of the dermis after this treatment. That was fantastic. So at what age, um would you start? Uh, what is the youngest age for scar tissue and acne? At what age would you want people? To well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. The answer to the question is, is I go to Fraxel when their acne is quiescent. Okay. I do not use Fraxel on an, a patient who is still actively breaking out because they will get a flare. So what I do is I have other devices that I use that aren't as good as Fraxel for the actual scarring, but they don't exacerbate the acne. They're actually therapeutic for the acne. And that would be like the laser genesis device on my XLV vascular laser platform because the 1064 component, and I have another one that I've used now for like 25 years called Cool Touch which we still use because it helps acne scars, but it also helps active acne. And so you don't get an acne flare when you're treating that. And as soon as the acne has been quiescent for usually at least six months, so it doesn't matter if they're 18 or they're 30 or they're 45, right. um, uh, you can do Fraxel on teenagers, but their acne needs to be under control. So if you get the acne completely cleared, with Accutane, uh, you want to wait about uh, a good six months and you can start your Fraxel treatments. And the number you need depends on the aggressiveness of the physician and their comfort level with the Fraxel and um, the severity of the scars. So typically the way I'm aggressive with Fraxel, because I'm so comfortable with it, I mean, when I'm doing a Fraxel for aging, one treatment, they get significant improvement of the skin quality that was damaged from aging. But with acne, I usually tell people that they're gonna need a series. So typically at least maybe three over maybe a year's time. And with my aging with Fraxel, I'll typically recommend that people get a Fraxel. I have patients that don't want to do injections for whatever reason. So Fraxel's a great tool. I also do CO2. Uh, when I want to be really aggressive and I want to get really dramatic results and the patient doesn't mind significant, like one week, stay at home, absolute downtime. Because right. the downtime with Fraxel is not too bad. After about three days, if they don't mind looking kind of puffy and dry, in a pinch, they could lube up and put their sunscreen on and go and run, run an errand. But 
with CO2, I don't let them go outside for a week. Right. So, so what should people look for when they're looking for a, a scar improvement in, in their dermatologist? What kind of questions should they ask to really be sure that they're in the right hands? Well, some, well, the experience of the physician is of the utmost importance. And I'm a big believer that if it has anything to do with the skin, you should see a board certified dermatologist. And at the risk of offending uh, plastic and facial plastic surgeons who are great with doing facelifts and, and some things, when it comes to acne scars, send them to the dermatologist. We will do a better job because the skin and the skin healing and skin disease is our forte. I mean, we don't have any problem sending facelifts to our plastic surgery colleagues. It actually absolutely stuns me when instead of sending an acne scar to their dermatologist friend who sends them facelift, they send them to their esthetician who doesn't understand skin nearly as well as a board certified dermatologist. So um, I think patients should also always be treated by the best physician for the specific problem that they present with. So with acne scars, um, what I do is I clinically distend the scar and it tells me a lot. Because if the scar is not distensible, then I have to be so much more aggressive than if the scar is dis dis uh, distendable, meaning I can stretch it and make it look like it's not there. I also, you know, a lot of people call things acne scars, which are really post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and or post-inflammatory hyperemia, which means they are just red for a long time. And the actual texture of the skin is not significantly impacted. So, you know, I evaluate the color of the skin, the distensibility of the scar, and the palpability of the scar. Um, and like, let's talk specifically about pitted scars. Because Fraxel nor CO2 are, are, pretty, are any good, really, for pitted scars. There's only one thing that works on pitted scars, and it's a procedure called um, um, TCA cross. And it stands for chemical resurfacing of surgical scars. But uh, it really is the treatment of choice for pits. And we actually take 100% trichloroacetic acid. And we use a sterile toothpick, and we actually kind of twirl that Q-tip down that pit. And it causes a re-epithelialization of the lining of that pit. And the pit with each treatment gets shallower and shallower. And then when you go afterwards and you do Fraxel, and in some cases, by the way, I do sometimes use uh, microneedling and sometimes radiofrequency microneedling. So, you know, I have a lot of toys in my practice and it allows me to cherry pick you know, you don't want to go to a doctor who only has one device because when you own an expensive hammer, everything is treated like a nail. How many devices do you have, by the way, in your office? You know, I probably have about 15. But, you know, the ones that we use just about every day are our Fraxel, our IPL, uh, you know, our radio frequency um, devices for tightening and radio frequency microneedling, our laser hair. I'm so excited about our new, about... Um, I guess it's been two years now. We've had the Splendor X. We were the first practice in the United States to get it from Italy. And it's a, it's a blended Alexandrite and YAG. So it's great for full treatment of the entire hair follicle. Plus it's got two forms of cooling. It's got contact cooling and forced air cooling. So it is absolutely the most painless laser we have ever used and patients absolutely love it. Right. And so we got a lot of devices, but you know, if my, if the building is on fire, the two that I'm going to grab first are going to be my Fraxel and my XLV. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, gosh, we've had an awesome, awesome time. And uh, let's just shift over to your practice. Are you, are you open 25%, 50%? You're probably open it's about, it's about, uh, you know, um, it's about 50%. Okay. 
And that's not because of demand, it's because of spatial distancing. And, um, and so people are, we're booked into June. Okay. Because uh, people really, really want to come in, but they appreciate that we want to be safe. Um, I want to say a hi to Jeff um, from Accuvain. Remember him? He's our old pal from Cosmetic Bootcamp. He, yeah, yeah, he was right next he to He said us. hello, and I happened to catch it. You know, um, just to give Jeff a plug, I, I showed, I was the first doctor, just like I was the first doctor on the stage at, at Bootcamp to use CLN before injecting uh, filler. I was the first doctor in the United States at, at, at boot camp many years ago to use the AccuVein to help spot the veins on the face to avoid them to avoid bruising patients. Yeah. And uh, Jeff, since then, um, a lot of me uh, other cosmetic dermatologists use his device and have posted on his device. But and the third thing that I was the first, a third thing that I did first at boot camp was I did the Aqua Gold where I did a little concoction, and this was probably about 10 years ago, where I mixed botulinum, I mixed Botox, and I mixed, uh, I think it was Bellatero, and a little sterile saline, and a little lidocaine. And it was to get the, um, the epidermal and superior dermal effects of the botulinum toxin to relax the cholinergics that make pores look bigger. So you get a pore constriction effect. And then with the HA, you get a uh, surface uh, hydration of the effect uh, on the skin. And so we did that. And now a lot of people are posting about uh, aqua gold. And the other thing I was the first to do was to hyper blend Radius um, at a one-to-one -one formula back about 2007 at boot camp to inject the hands and using a cannula. So we've done a lot of of really innovative things at Cosmetic Bootcamp. We are gonna have a virtual meeting this year, July 10th, that weekend. Rod Rourke, who you know well, is going to be yes. doing the live cadaver head dissection, and we're gonna have taped injections to complement um, the anatomy to show clinically what we do in danger areas and stuff like that. And then, of course, we're gonna have discussions on things like acne and pigmentation and lasers and combining fillers and combining fillers and toxins and which toxins we're using where, how we're combining them, what we think uh, are the strengths and relative weaknesses of each of the fillers and toxins and stuff like that. So, so we've got a lot planned. That's, that's July uh, we're the one day, the one day. No, it's going to have to be like a few hours over a three day period, like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, eight hour days or half days? No, it won't be eight hours. It's probably gonna be somewhere between uh, low end of four and a, a high end of six. We're still working out the details. Okay. And we're gonna encourage our um, vendors. Um, we're gonna have a virtual show, uh, room. You remember how, the, how you would be in the room and yeah. you would have a table and you'd have a display. Right. We're gonna encourage people, we're gonna incentivize them to go into your virtual room and right. where they can ask questions and see data that you have and want to present and things like that. Okay, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. Well, great. Uh, Mary, thank you for coming on again. Always lots of information. We really dug into acne and um, we've uh, had a lot of your friends. You're seeing the, the comments go by as well, right? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm looking at you and I, every once in a while I'll catch it. I saw something, and I don't know what it was in regards to, that said California says it causes cancer. Did you happen to catch what in the world? Uh, I think it's one of the lasers. Was it the Italian laser that they? Uh, it's it's one of the lasers that they thought California does not approve. Um, well, the Splendor X is uh, is Alexandrite seven fifty five and Yag ten sixty four, and you know, those, those um, ranges on the electromagnetic spectrum um, are, are not cancer causing. You know, that's in the ultraviolet and the ultra short. <laughs> Somebody says California says that about everything. Yeah. Yeah, I'm beginning to think so. Okay. Yeah. So, 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, listen, there's room in this world for everybody. Yeah. Um, if everybody wanted a laser, we wouldn't be able to accommodate them. So it's just fine that people want to eat their granola and, and, and leave aging to their genetics. That's fine. We yeah. I don't need to treat everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we love California. I'm partial. That's where my career uh, started and we developed, you know, it's great for innovation stints, you know, Allergan was there and sure. Uh, so sure. Allergan is there. Evelis is there. Cool yeah. skull is there there's yeah. there's so many things there a lot of the devices i think qtera has their uh headquarters there yeah. i mean it's you know there's a lot of tech there are a lot of tech tech right. geniuses out there uh but you know we, we, uh, ipl doesn't cause cancer uh and that's been proven and 1064 and yeah. 755 all of these things so you know, you know, your your physician is always your best source of information. Yes, yeah, your board certified physician, absolutely. Okay, Mary, thank you so much. I think we've uh, gone a little uh, long, but it was fun. People love hearing uh, you and learning from you. We've had a lot of great comments. We uh, can't reach all of them. Um, well, I encourage anybody to direct message me through Lupo Dermatology Instagram account. I'm happy to answer questions. Sure. Um, and if someone has a, uh, a, a contrarian view and wants to have a live discussion, you know, I'm, I'm pretty contrarian. I, <laughs> you know me, I don't, I don't back down from anything, do I? Not at all. Not at all. We love it. We love it. You, you tell us like it is. All, all right. right. Well, thank Thanks, you. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Safe, yeah. safe weekend for all. Take care. Bye everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you.